Good morning, St. John's. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for your prophet, Michael, that we're looking at this morning. Uh, we thank you for his words, and we pray that uh, you will unpack them now for us, and to him speak to each of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you can well find out by now, then uh, I'm not able to be with you at the moment because I, I have COVID, uh, but uh, I'm not quite firing on all, all cylinders, but as you can see, I'm alive and well, and it's good to be with you, at least by video this morning. In Advent, we've been looking at uh, our, the lectionary readings from the prophets in the Old Testament uh, over the, uh, the four weeks of our Advent period. And uh, they've been sharing some of the characteristics of God's anticipated coming to Israel. Uh, the first one of those, Jeremiah, we, we looked at him and uh, do you remember he talked about how a righteous branch would come from David's line and Jesus would be that righteous branch. And did you course, somebody from David's line, Jesus does come. In Malachi, uh, we look forward to uh, God purifying his people uh, with a refiner's fire. A very strong imagery about what Jesus would do to burn off the dross from our lives. And then last week, from Zephaniah, we, uh, we thought about, particularly we focused on one word, the word with, and how Zephaniah used that on a couple of occasions in that short reading that we looked at, but also how Jesus would be God with us. Well, today we're thinking about uh, the prophet Micah and what he looked forward to and indeed the way he was quoted later on in scripture and uh, we're thinking about God shepherding his flock. Micah went further than the others in the sense that uh, uh, there, there's some general characteristics of what the coming of God would be like but Micah is very specific because he spells out where it's going to happen. He spells out that it's going to be in Bethlehem and uh, yeah, indeed, uh, Micah 5.2 is quoted in a slightly abbreviated form in Matthew uh, 2.6 by Herod's advisors. And I'll just read it now. Uh, Herod's advisors point out to Herod that actually this is kind of public knowledge because <laughs> it's written in the prophets. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the, other, the rulers of Judah. Out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Herod himself had failed his Old Testament test. Um, uh, he didn't know where the new king of Israel would come from. He had to ask. Uh, indeed, he even after he got the information from his advisors about where all this was going to happen, and he when they had the wise man and told them to, when, after they'd been to Bethlehem, find out where, specifically where the child was and come and tell him. But even they wised up to the fact that he was trying to trick them. Uh, so uh, he failed in that attempt too. Herod uh, failed both his Old Testament knowledge, it's good to know the Bible, uh, and he also failed in his attempt to do uh, something that would very much not have been God's will. And Bethlehem itself was not much of a place. Uh, as Tessa commented in her uh, after reflection this week, one of the days this week, um, she commented that actually it was a sufficiently insignificant place that when Joshua was dividing up the promised land, Bethlehem doesn't even get a mention. It means, of course, house of bread. Uh, and it's not surprising that uh, the bread of life would come from a place called something like that. But in so many ways, uh, Bethlehem was not really on the map until Jesus. And in so many ways, Jesus turns upside down the standards of the world. He does that in his arrival and in his birth. Could have been in a spangly hospital. Uh, could have been in an impressive palace. But it wasn't. It was in a messy place with smell and mess of animals. 
that's how he came into the world. And then, where did he spend his life after, after he nipped off to Egypt for a couple of years as an infant? Then where does he spend his life? Well, he in Nazareth and Capernaum, a couple of pretty small and significant places up north, long way from Jerusalem. And what does he do? Well, he encounters various sick people. He turns things upside down for them. He heals them. Uh, he encounters a storm. What does he do? He calms it. He uh, turns things upside down there. He meets on three occasions, actually. He uh, comes into contact with a dead person. And what does he do? He raises them back to life. And he turns things upside down there. And what does he do when he's meeting sinners? He's telling them that your sins are forgiven by God. He's turning things upside down there as well. And even on the cross, a place of death and pain, and uh, for most, the, uh, the ultimate defeat. And even on the cross, he's winning a uh, victory over sin and death. Uh, he's turning things upside down even there. And of course the ultimate reversal is when God raises him to life. He dies, but he's risen. So he's alive. And he's worse. That really is turning things upside down. Now Micah said that the one who was going to come was going to shepherd his flock. And the biblical image about shepherding the flock is something that comes up on various occasions. Um, as some of you might have read uh, um, a, bit, a chunk of Ezekiel 34 uh, during during this week, and there's a, Ezekiel is making a real comparison there between the good shepherd who is to come and the bad shepherds who are not doing what they should in caring for God's people, and uh, then that flicks forward, fast forward a few few hundred years. Then you've got Jesus describing himself as the good shepherd in John chapter 10. Uh, and that's why we've got, we call churches things like uh, the place where my mom lives, her local church is called the Church of the Good Shepherd. Um, in, uh, in Rossmore, our church that we planted at St John's in, a long time ago now in the 30s, uh, is called the Church of the Good Shepherd because Jesus is. The good shepherd. And the result of all this is that God's people can live securely. Micah tells us that. He says God's people are going to be able to live securely because they're going to be looked after by the good shepherd. And uh, the last verse of our passage this morning spells out the result, um, which is that it says, He. Jesus will be our peace. I love the fact that Jesus is revealed in the mess and the smell of the place with animals. Even as I, I look at uh, my computer recording this, if I cut my eyes up there, I've got a little little, little tableau um, put aside, a picture of, of the scene with Mary, Joseph, the baby, Jesus, and the shepherds and the wise men. And the animals and so on and it's a great reminder that we are whatever our mess is and jesus steps into a, a messed up world so um actually even covid itself is one example of this it's just a, a reflection of our messed up world and however however things pan out we can be confident that uh, jesus is in our peace in all the chaos that otherwise reigns. Jesus is our peace. That's wonderful news. And so as we look forward to his arrival at Christmas and to all well celebrate then, uh, let's pray. Oh God, thank you that you step into our mess. We sometimes see the light of the world, you step down into darkness. We thank you that's true and we pray that as we celebrate Christmas I mean whatever um, 
is not good in our own lives, may we know you among us, because we pray it in Jesus' name. Bye folks, I'll look forward to seeing you after my uh, isolation period is over in the new year and uh, we'll I'll celebrate the start of a new year together and uh, all that's, look forward to all that's going to hold.